we have a featured guest speaker, and he's my friend John Benzinger, and uh, he will be speaking today on the subject of stewardship and giving, and I think that's going to be a really great message for us. He's the pastor of Redeemer Church in Gilbert, Arizona, and uh, let me tell his story. He'll tell you maybe a little bit more, but… Um, he started, that, he started in that church as a revitalizing movement. It had about 190 people in it, and then he grew it to 90 people. All right? Maybe you've been in one of those churches where it's, it's hard plowing at first. Well, it, it, from there, it exploded to a couple thousand people. Almost overnight, God just did a great work there. Disciples are being made. People are being saved. And uh, today, it's such a joy to bring him here. He's been a friend of mine for several years now. And I uh, just want to say a couple things. He and his wife, Katie, have four sweet kids, Colin, Ava, Emma, and Jace, and a golden retriever named Riley. All right? And so this morning, he's going to bring God's Word to you. Would you welcome my friend, John Benzinger? Let's welcome him. Welcome, John. Hey, Central, how are you? Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your warm welcome already. Um, your pastor is amazing, isn't he? I'm very blessed by his friendship, very blessed to know him. So if you brought a Bible, open it to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. As Matt said, my name's John. I'm a big fan of Tennessee. Actually, I'll, I will be back in Tennessee next month. My in-laws live in Franklin, and every fall we visit them for a couple of weeks. We love it here in Tennessee. Now, I bring you greetings from this still 100 degree desert of Arizona. So we recently broke a record. Well, I, I had nothing to do with this record. I actually hate this record. But uh, the heat in Arizona just broke a record, still ongoing to this day, for consecutive days over 100 degrees. Let's, let's raise our hands. How many of you think it's over 75 days in a row? Oh, all of you without your hands raised, you, you've never been to Arizona then? Today is 104th day in a row of over 100 degrees. So uh, I'm really glad to be here this morning. Now listen, if you think that's hot, the message might be a little hotter than that for you. So just want to warn you now, it's just a warning. You know, with that kind of introduction, let me pray and then let's get into God's Word. God, I need you, we need you. Use this time, please, to draw us closer to you and closer to your will for our lives. That's what matters. That's what we need. We, we, we want to live for you. We want to honor you with our lives. And so please do this in all of our lives. Please do this through your word, I pray. Amen. So I heard an author recently tell a story about his first Major League Baseball game. He was a child. It was Pittsburgh, Forbes Field. It's the mid-1940s. His uncle takes him to the game. And as they were turning the corner to find their seats, his uncle commanded him, hold on to your wallet. So he reached into his pocket and he grabbed it and his uncle said to him, hold it tight. So he did. Little seven-year-old guy, well, well, as they got to their seats, he still had his hand in his, on his wallet. So he asked his uncle if he could let go. And before his uncle said yes, he peeked up and he looked around and he said, okay, it, it's okay. Then he asked his uncle, well, what was that all about? And his uncle said, you see that man over there with a the funny collar turned around backwards, pointing at a priest? He said, anytime you see one of those guys, hold on to your wallet, because all they want is your money. Now, be honest, when you saw the word stewardship, you held on to your wallet a little bit, didn't you? But listen, stewardship is a lot more than money. It's about a lot more than money. In fact, there is not a single aspect in your life or mine that stewardship should not inform, impact, influence, and even this idea of stewardship even impose itself on. So my hope today is that you will walk out of here saying to yourself, as part of how you see yourself, I am a steward with a vast stewardship entrusted to your care. So let's jump into this idea of stewardship today with point number one, if you're taking notes, the definition of stewardship. The definition of stewardship. What is stewardship? What is a steward? To start to answer that, I want to illustrate what a steward is with, with the parable here in Luke 12. Starting in verse 42, Jesus gives us some of the most, some of the basics on stewardship. He, Peter asks him a question and Peter's response, or Jesus' response in 42 is, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? 
Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Now I read that a little fast, but I want you to notice some things. First, there is a manager or a steward who is related, notice, to a what? To a master. One is, one is in charge and the other has a charge. Second, the steward in the ancient world, verse 42, is set over the master's household, which means that while the steward is a servant, he is also the manager of what? Of all the other servants the master had. So some synonyms for steward would be supervisor, manager, administrator, trustee. He's managing the assets of another. And third, the steward oversees not just the other servants, he also oversees the inner workings of the master's house, his desires, his affairs. Verse 44, notice his possessions. Now the definition of stewardship is built on a theological foundation that's stated in, in uh, 1 Chronicles 29, 11, which says, all that is in the heavens and in the earth is God's. He owns it all. Right. Psalm 24, 1 puts it this way, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. You put that all together, the translation is uh, God owns everything. Yeah. He has complete, comprehensive, all-inclusive ownership of everything that ever was, is, or ever will be. Amen. And listen, if God go owns everything, that means we own nothing. Raise your hands. How many of you own your home? No, I tricked you. <laughs> right? You have a home, but the reality is you do not own your home. To have it is not to own it. It is yours to manage, not yours to own. So with all of, this, all of this in mind, with the foundation of God's ownership of all things firmly in place, I can now give you a definition of stewardship. Stewardship is a domain of oversight entrusted to someone's care to manage it how the owner pleases and to manage it for the owner's benefit and about which the steward will be evaluated one day. So I know that's a lot, I'm gonna repeat it for you. Stewardship is a domain of oversight entrusted to someone's care to manage it as the owner pleases for the owner's benefit and about which the steward will be evaluated one day. So I know that's long, but I'm gonna unpack all of that in the rest of this message. But if you just want a shorter, more concise definition of stewardship, just think entrusted management. The management of an owner's property entrusted to somebody else's care. Do you remember when the people on uh, boats or airplanes were called stewards or stewardesses? Do you remember that? I, I guess that's offensive now. But uh, back in the day, that's what they were called. And, and it's a good word, think about it. They don't own the boat, they don't own the plane, right? The company owns it and they what? They are entrusted with the responsibility to care for what the company owns. And the same idea is true for us. People who own rental properties often use a management company to look after their property. Well, 1 Peter 4.10 calls every Christian a steward, which means each one of us is a manager, an employee working for God's management company and trusted with part of his property to steward it well. So what are we exactly stewards of, you and I? Well, for that, let's look at point number two, the domain of stewardship. The domain, the, the area, the sphere of oversight that we have as stewards. Well, what, what would that be? What is our domain of stewardship? Well, 1 Corinthians 4, 7 answered this in no uncertain terms by asking us a question. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 asks, what do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? The answer is what? It's nothing. There is not even one thing that we have that we did not receive. Therefore, since everything that you have is owned by God, and since everything you have came from God, the domain of your stewardship is what? It's everything. Everything we are, everything we have, that's what we are all stewards of, everything. Everything in our lives, that's all, just everything. Now, I know that, that might be helpful, but maybe a bit overwhelming. So in order to give us some clarity on this, everything, what does that mean? I, I, I've tried to make it easier to grasp by saying, by dividing the word everything into two categories, our roles and our responsibilities. 
our roles and our responsibilities. God has entrusted our roles to us, our roles as husband or wife or parent or child, coworker or student, church member. These are the, the roles that God has entrusted to us. And then God has also entrusted our resources to us. Well, what are those? What, what is that? Our souls, our bodies, our minds, our knowledge, our emotions, our time, our finances, our property, our passions, our skills, on and on and on. You can begin to make a list of all kinds of resources that God has entrusted to us. All of it's been entrusted by God to us and all of that is what we are to manage as God pleases to manage for his benefit and all of the management is what we will give an account for to the master, to the owner one day. So what is the domain of our stewardship? It's everything we are. That is the roles that God's given us. It's everything we have. That's the resources God has given us. So we are to steward all areas of our lives. Well, how do we do that? How do you know you're doing this well? For that point number three, I'm going to give you the distinctions of stewardship. The distinctions of stewardship. In other words, if you've been given a domain of oversight, the question should be what marks, what distinguishes a good steward from what? from a bad one? Yeah. What character traits, what qualities, what virtues describe a good steward? Well, if you're spending months thinking about this, studying a, a, a ton of different texts in the Bible on stewardship, I see nine qualities of a good steward in the Bible, nine character traits, nine virtues that distinguish a good steward from a bad one. However, before I get to that, I need to start with a question. And the question is, before talking about stewardship, the question is, are you born again? Before ever being a steward, you have to be a Christian. Amen. Stewardship is the result of being a Christian. Listen, it is not the pathway to becoming a Christian. You see, all this talk of stewardship can make some people think that God will save them based on how well they steward his stuff. But that could not be farther from the truth. Amen. The truth is you and I have been horrible managers of what God has entrusted to us. He's given us life and breath and everything else. And in return, we've ignored him, disrespected him, denied him, even defied him. Not just a few times, but thousands and thousands of times. We've served ourselves instead of him. We've worshiped and created things like money and status and reputation instead of worshiping him. We've traded his truth for lies. We've even spread lies about him. We've trusted in human teachers instead of God's one and only unique special son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In short, we have sinned against God. Amen. And the paycheck we earned for all of that sin is condemnation, punishment, death and hell forever. But being rescued from all of that once and for all, now and forever, belongs, only belongs to those who believe in Jesus. Condemnation, punishment, judgment, wrath, all of that is accomplished by our good works, but salvation and rescue and deliverance from all of that is not accomplished by your good works. It was accomplished by Jesus' work, his death and resurrection to pay for our sins. And his resurrection proves that, that God accepted that payment. So all who do not trust in their good works, but trust in Jesus, they are saved. They are rescued from condemnation, sin, death, wrath, and hell. And if you haven't done so already, right now would be a great time. Today is the day of salvation for you. It's a, it, would be, it is the perfect time to turn from your rebellion, to turn from your trust in good works, and to believe in Jesus. Trust him, no teacher, no prophet, no organization, no course, no curriculum. Trust in Jesus alone and you will be set free from all of your sin and guaranteed, sealed with his blood, that when you stand before God, you will do so not as a criminal, but as his child. Amen. Now, salvation is by faith, is by trusting in Jesus alone, but that faith is never alone. It is always accompanied by a transformed heart, which shows itself in a changed life. Not a sinless life, but a different life. The direction of a person's life goes from wanting to please self as master and Lord to wanting to please Christ as master and Lord, which brings us full circle back to the idea of stewardship. Stewardship is the result of faith in Jesus. It is the goal now that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Stewardship really is Jesus' Lordship in all areas of our lives. So in fact, you could even summarize the idea of stewardship with stewardship is lordship. That's what it is. So what character traits then, what, what qualities, what virtues distinguish good stewards? The first one is loyalty. Loyalty, he remains exclusively committed to his master, even when he is tempted to be disloyal to his master, even by being loyal to self. 
Second, a good steward is present. He's on duty. He's, he's not like the steward we'll see later in Luke 12, 45, who stopped doing his job in order to do other things instead, like beating people up and eating and drinking and getting drunk. No, no, he's at his post doing his job because he is the third. A good steward is dedicated. Dedicated. He's not, he's not passive. He's not lacking initiative. He is dedicated to the management that he has been entrusted with. Fourth, a good steward is marked by diligence. A good steward can never be scolded like the one in Matthew 25, 26, who is called, quote, a wicked and slothful servant. No, he is diligent. He works hard to please his master. Fifth, a good steward is intentional. He's not aimless or apathetic. In the words of 2 Corinthians 5, 9, he, is, he has an aim. He has a, a goal, a, a desire to please his master. His goals match the master's goals, and he works hard to meet those goals. Six, a good steward is submissive. Submissive, he's not self-willed, meaning he's, he's obedient. He, he follows the will of his master. He, he's, like that, he's like those dogs in those old RCA advertisements with their ear up, tuned to the voice of his master, ready to obey. He follows his will. He knows that what matters most is that his master is pleased. And that pleases the servant. Seventh, a good steward is sacrificial. Why? Because he desires, his desires are his master's desires. He knows his, his, as a manager, he's entrusted with a domain of oversight from God himself. So when there's ever a conflict between what God wants and what he wants, the, the good steward sacrifices self in order to please God. In other words, he's not selfish, self-absorbed. He's not working for himself to fulfill his own desires. And that is because eighth, a good steward is humble. There's no air of self-importance about a good steward. He doesn't think highly of himself because he's no, he knows he's not the master. And he doesn't treat others like he is the master. He knows he's merely a manager working for the master. And he knows that a prideful steward is a contradiction. All of that means ninth, ninth the good steward is wise. Jesus calls the ideal uh, steward a wise steward in Luke 12, 42. Why? Because calls him that because an absentee rogue that is lazy, selfish, apathetic, disobedient, and arrogant is a fool. That is a foolish steward. He's a fool because he forgot what? He forgot everything he has and everything he, he does does not belong to him. But he's acting like it does when he's foolish, acting like he's the master and acting like it doesn't manage, matter how he manages his roles and it doesn't matter how he manages his resources but oh, it definitely does. The wise steward embodies all of these distinctives above because he's dominated by point number four, the demand of stewardship. The demand of stewardship. There is a 10th distinctive and that distinctive really covers the rest. Jesus talks about this quality most when he talks about stewardship. It is required, it is essential. You cannot be a good steward without this. So that if you, if you have this, you, you pretty much have the other nine that we just talked about. Let's let the Bible tell us what that quality is. And in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it says it is required, so it's not optional, it is required of stewards that they be found, you know what the word is? That they be found faithful. In the context of 1 Corinthians 4, Paul is saying that we may be tempted to judge the quality of a pastor by their eloquence, their giftedness, their results, their, their knowledge, their initiative, their interpersonal skills. But the non-negotiable prerequisite, what is demanded and expected, the requirement of stewardship is faithfulness, being dependable, being reliable. It's trustworthiness, in other words, being worthy of the master's trust. Other qualities, other virtues, they may be desired in a steward, things like strength or competence or good with money or delegation or getting results. But there is only one essential mark, and that is, are you worthy of the master's trust? He honors his master by doing what is expected of him. He accomplishes what his master wants in each domain of his oversight. Remember, Jesus calls stewards like this. He calls them good and what? Faithful servants. 
because they not only did what their master told them to do, but they blessed their master by what they did. He trusted them with oversight and they followed through. Really, what good stewards do is they they give God the immense blessing of seeing the faithfulness of his son lived out in their faithfulness. Now, here's the thing. Paul's argument in verse Corinthians 4 for faithfulness comes from the fact that it is only God who determines faithfulness, not anyone else, which is why 1 Corinthians 4, 2 uses the phrase found faithful. Because you see point number five, there is a destination of stewardship, a destination of stewardship. Stewardship, in other words, has a goal. It has an end. It has a destination. And it is the day that the master meets back up with the servant to evaluate the stewardship of his property. Stewardship carries with it responsibility. And as we've been seeing today, it also carries with it a, an accountability that our stewardship is going to be assessed. Jesus, the loving savior of sinners, stressed this more than anyone else. Listen to Luke 12 again, verse 42. Who is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he doesn't know. To tell him he loves him and his negligence is really no big deal because he's forgiven. Your Bible say that? And an hour he doesn't know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. This is Luke 19. You want to turn there, you can. Luke 19, starting in verse 12, says, A nobleman went out into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, which is about three months' worth of wages. And he said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and set a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered that these servants to whom he'd given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came to him saying, Lord, your mind has made 10 minus more. And he said to him, it doesn't matter what you produce. I just love you anyway. Is that what your Bible says? No, he says to him, well done, good servant. Because you've been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. You notice, again, there is an assessment and there is a reward for faithfulness. This is Matthew 25, starting in verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled the counts with them, opened up the books. Let's take a look at what's, what, what you guys have been doing while I've been gone. And he who received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five talents more. And his master said, you're greedy. I don't care about what you produce because I just love you. I'm not a socialist. No, I am a socialist, actually. I don't care about what you produced. I just love you. Doesn't say that. His master said to him, well done. Good job. Good job making money for me. Good job taking what I gave you and doing something with it. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much and turn to the joy of your master. Once again, there is an assessment and a reward for what faithfulness produced in one's area of stewardship. Finally, this is 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 9, where it says, We make it our aim to please him. We make it our aim, our goal, our drive, our desire. It is to please him. Why? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must. It's non-negotiable. God's not going to lose your file. You're not going to miss this appointment. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. You see, in the stewardship analogy, 
the master always comes back. And he always evaluates the stewardship, the management, the oversight of his stewards. One of my life verses, which I repeat a lot, is Luke 12, 48. To whom much is given, much will be requested. To whom much is required, much will be requested, much will be hoped for. Much will be what? Required. Required. And listen, compared to all the people in history and compared to all the people on the planet now, all of us are filthy rich. We've been given so much, we've been entrusted with so much, which means, which means we will be required. A lot will be required from us when we stand before Jesus for our performance review. And on that review will be what we did with our roles as Christians, as husbands, as wives, as fathers and mothers and co-workers and students and church members. And on that review will be what we did with our resources, really with whose resources? God's resources. Things like our skills, our knowledge, our time, our finances, our passions. And at that review, we will receive the rewards that we are due for our faithful stewardship. Our faithful stewardship of our roles and resources. Notice, go back and look at it. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we will receive what we are due. That is what the word says or we will receive the discipline we are due for our lack of faithful stewardship. So let me ask you, what if the words of Luke 12, 46, what if today was the day you didn't expect the day the master came for you, came for your performance review? And Jesus said, I gave you this role, I gave you this this resource, I gave you this relationship, I gave you this skill, I gave you this resource, I gave you this opportunity. Let's open the books and see what you did with it. Listen, if just bringing that up kind of, if that worries you, do not forget that God is a God of grace. God's grace cleanses us from all sin when we own it, when we confess it to him as sin. So if you, if you need to do that in terms of your stewardship, then by all means, do that. But God's grace, according to Titus 2.12, also trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. God's grace cleanses us from our lack of stewardship, and it is that same grace that what? That motivates us to be the kinds of stewards, to be more the kinds of stewards that God wants us to be. Sadly, I think most Christians live like I've got my get out of hell free card, and that's really all that matters. I love that Christians know they can't earn their salvation, I love that they know that salvation is by grace alone, not earning it, through faith alone, not works, and in Christ alone as we sang, and not in anyone else. Salvation is not by works, a thousand times yes, but Christian, you still have to work. And I hope you've seen today that the Bible places an emphasis on productivity, not for salvation, but certainly after salvation, and that flows from the idea that you and I, we are stewards. You are stewards of the people sitting next to you in many ways. You're stewards of the church that you have here. You're stewards of your job. You're stewards of your resource. You are stewards of all of those things. Again, that should be a kind of identity that as you think of yourself, you should think of yourself as a steward. That's not legalism, by the way. That is the result of the gospel. A a life lived as God's steward because of the salvation he has so graciously and kindly offered, the salvation you, he has so graciously and kindly given to us. I'm so glad that we love Jesus, but we need to love him by embracing the truth that we are all stewards of the grace that he has shown each one of us, a stewardship each of us will give an account for one day. So we need to live like that day is real, right? Amen. We need to live like that appointment is coming. Because that appointment is coming, it is inevitable, and it is unavoidable. Don't be like those students who show up to class and, didn't, and forgot that there was a test. Live, like your li- live your life like I am a steward of the roles and resources that God has given to me. You do that, you just start there today. If you haven't even thought of that for, your, for, for all of this time, if you start with that today and you seek to do that for the rest of your life, You are well on your way to receiving the ultimate reward when you stand before Jesus and it's hearing what? 
well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Why? Because you, as a steward, you were entrusted with a domain of oversight to manage it as the owner pleases, to manage it for his benefit and for his blessing. Because you took seriously that about your management of his stuff, you lived like you would be evaluated one day by the master. Now I want to end by speaking to what Matt talked about earlier, the, the two specific stewardships that most pastors do not like talking about, myself included. The first is church and the second is money. And I'm ending here because I'm afraid that of, of all of the areas of stewardship that we're destined to give an account for, when our church involvement and our bank accounts come up, many of us, that is when we will be most embarrassed. And I do, I do not want that for you. I don't want that for me. So let's talk about it. I've been at the church that I've been the, I'm, the, I'm privileged to be the pastor of, been there for 10 years now. And in those 10 years, I've preached 393 sermons in those 10 years. And only four of them have been on giving. I haven't talked about money that much, but there is a preacher who did talk about it a lot. And his name is Jesus. Amen. He said radical things about money. Things that when we read it, we say that's true. But things that would drastically change our lives if we actually lived them. Like Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Or Luke 12, 15, that one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Do we really believe that? Or Luke 12, 21, that a fool is the one who lays up for himself, lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Which one are we most rich in, truly? And then there's Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. More blessed, really? See, based on the most basic reading of Jesus, there is an unbreakable connection between how we think about money and what we do with our money and our Christian lives. Either money acts like our God or God will set the agenda for our money. So let me summarize what the Bible teaches on the stewardship of our money. And it starts with this. It's not really what? What was that? It's not really our money. It's God's money. We are his money managers. We are his financial advisors investing his money Investing the money that he has transferred into our accounts, yes, to meet our needs, yes, to have some fun, but it is also given to us for, for far more. God does his will in the world through his money in our accounts. We don't own anything. And we have money because God gave it to us. We manage everything, including God's money, to give him the best return on the investment that he made when he entrusted his money to us to manage. Or to be more specific, it is in your best interest, both now and eternally, to invest God's money in God's work. And listen, that should start in your local church. It should start here. We are to use the money God has entrusted to us to further the work, his work in the world. And the place that financial investment should start is your church. So I want you to see this. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians 6, Paul is wrapping up his explanation of the gospel. And starting in chapter 5, he's been explaining the effect of the gospel on the lives of those who believe the gospel. And here in chapter 6, verse 6, it's the gospel and money. And he writes these words. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. So let me ask you a very basic question. Do you hear the Bible when you come to the ministries of Central? Do you hear the Bible? Okay, I want you to look at that text. 
I want you to listen to it again. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. The text says, if you do hear the word, then you should support the ministry financially. Look at the text. First, it is individual. It says, let the one. So, so this is each Christian in a local church. Next, notice the issue is not who's doing the teaching or how gifted they are or the programs that are offered. Notice the issue is the content of the teaching. It's the word, it's the Bible, it's, it's the gospel. If the word is what you are being taught, then this text sets an expectation. It's, a, it's actually a divine command to give here. Amen. Giving to solid churches is how the word spreads. Giving to solid churches is how more and more disciples are multiplied and matured. Also, third, notice the instruction, the word share, refers to financial support like it does in Philippians 4.15. And it's a command, not for one time, sporadic, inconsistent giving, but it is a command to ongoing, regular, consistent, in the habit of giving financial support to your word teaching local church. And then finally, notice the intimacy again. The word share means partnership, not payment. This is not a fee paid for goods provided. This is a togetherness. This is a, this is a family. I'm contributing to the needs of the family. It's each one of us shares the resources we have for the benefit and blessing of a solid ministry. So the question to ask yourself, is central a church that teaches and preaches God's word? And if it is, then you should entrust the money that God has entrusted to you to that church that you are a member of. And even if you're not a member, you should be, but even if you're not a member yet, if this is where you are being fed, if this is where you are, this is the, the church that you are a part of, then you should give here too. If you, and I want you to think about something. Have you noticed how ministries pro- promoting false teachers that deceive people and send them to hell, have you noticed how they have all the money they need and a whole lot more? You ever notice that? Why do you think the followers of false teachers are so generous while Christians being taught the word by solid pastors and solid churches usually aren't as generous? Also, you notice how some say, well, this church, look at everything around here. Church doesn't need my money. So they don't give to the church they attend. Then if they give it all, they say, uh, I give to other ministries that, that need my money. That's not the paradigm that we just saw in Galatians 6.6. 6. The paradigm there that God set up is all who spiritually benefit from a Bible teaching church should follow the Spirit's lead and financially benefit that church with God's money entrusted to us. Now, I know that can, can, can come off completely self-serving, and the cynics among us right now are already thinking that. But I say this to myself too. I know pastors who do not give to the church that employs them because they give it to other ministries. But in the Old Testament, Numbers 18, 26, the priests were supported by the people's giving and then the priests were to give 10% of that right back to God. They gave their own income in support of their own ministry. Now, what if you're sitting there right now and you're like, that's nice, John, good for you. You're gonna leave and you just drop that little bomb in here. Nice for you, but... I don't have two nickels to rub together. It's embarrassing, but I just can't do this. Well, verse, look at verse six. It says, it says, share all good things. Most scholars think that's money, but it doesn't stop there. This is broad to share the good that you have. Maybe you don't have money, but you can give time. Well, invest that. Maybe you don't have money to give, but you have a skill or a passion. Invest that here. Invest that here. Many, many Christians have all of that and they invest it everywhere else but here. They go join a bunch of nonprofits, a, a bunch of parachurch ministries, give all of their time and all their money to that and just like give, give tips to their local church. No, this text says start with your church. Amen. Now listen, I'm saying if you don't have money, which is probably not anybody here except for maybe the children and extreme cases super extreme cases. For the vast majority of us, what I just said doesn't apply at all because we have an income. And if we have an income, we should give part of that to our local church. What part you ask? 10%, at least 10%. I know Christians disagree on this. You know, welcome to Christianity where we disagree about everything, right? But based on things like 
Adam and Jake, or I'm sorry, Abraham and Jacob tithing bef- hundreds of years before the law was ever given. Based on the majority of Christian teaching since the early church and based on the grace of God, Christians should start, should start with giving 10% to their local church. I mean, think about it. In light of all of the grace that God has shown you as a Christian that the Old Testament people of God didn't have, things like a completed Bible, a new heart, forgiveness of sins, the work of the Spirit within you, and not to mention the death and resurrection of Jesus. In light of all of that grace, do you think that God's okay with our response to all of His grace being less than the 10% He expected in the Old Testament? So we've been given far more grace and God's cool with giving, us giving far less to his work as, our, as a response of love and gratitude for his grace? See, people who become adamant about grace giving often do so to hide the fact that they're not giving anything or that they're giving far less than 10% that the Old Testament believers gave. Now listen, if 10% is coming off to you as legalistic, one author said, then give 11, all right? But only if your church is what? Only if your church is teaching the Bible. It is your pastor's responsibility to make sure that this is a place that God wants you to invest his money in. And the pastor does that how? He proves that your church is worthy of your primary financial support only as he what? As he teaches the Bible. Which means a a church proves that it is not worthy of our support if what? If it does not teach the Bible. In case you're wondering right now, Matt had no idea that I was going to say these things. So, just so you know. One author asked the question, suppose you go and live in Africa for six months. You're going to live in Africa for six months. But to do so, there is only one rule. You cannot bring a single thing back with you. You can mail the money that you earn back to the United States, but you can only bring back to the U.S. what you brought with you to Africa and nothing else. So what would you do with the money that you earned at your job then? You'd take care of your needs, right? You'd probably have a little fun. But that might be about it, right? You can't keep anything you get in Africa, so you'd probably be mailing a good portion of your money back to the U.S., right? Your decisions will be driven by, but I can't keep this, so do I really need it? Or can I live without it so that I will have more money when I get home? That would make sense, since you can't take anything with you when you leave. See where I'm going? We can't take anything with us when we leave at death, but we can send it forward to our true home when we give God's money to a solid Bible teaching church. And then after that, beyond your church. One minute after we die, we will know how we should have lived our lives. And on the day when we reap the harvest that we planted with the good works that we sowed, I just don't want any of us to be in that moment and think, why didn't I do more? I wish I would have taken this seriously. I wish I would have done more. Instead, When we get God's money in alignment with his will as expressed in his word, that puts you, that puts me on the pathway to what? It puts us on the pathway to hearing the most wonderful words that we will ever hear. Well done. Good job. My good and faithful servant. Those words, those beautiful words, wonderful words will fuel an eternity of worship, of gratitude, of joy, 
And it is what you will hear if you take this idea of stewardship seriously. The band is going to come back to lead us in one more song. Join me in prayer. Well, Jesus, as a guest preacher, I can say these things and I can leave. And uh, this church has to deal with what I said. But I said all of these things to the church that you've entrusted to my care. And it has had an, an incredible impact on the people's lives as they take seriously the idea that they are stewards of your stuff. And money, again, is just one part of it. We're stewards of our families. We're stewards of our Christian walk with you. We're stewards of our jobs or our schoolwork. And we're stewards of our church. Help all of us to see ourselves as stewards and help all of us to take that identity seriously because that is the identity we will have when we stand before you. Nothing I said has to do with earning salvation. It's not that at all. It's for people who understand after I've been saved, I want to live for the Lord and I want to please him because I can't believe that he would save a sinner like me. So out of love for you, out of gratitude for you, do these things in all of our lives, I pray. Amen.